Chapter nine of On the Trail of the Space Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Trail of the Space Pirates by Carrie Rockwell. Chapter nine. That's the story, sir, said Strong to Commander Walters, after the Solar Guard captain had related the information he had warmed out of the bartender at the Space Lanes bar and the news Roger and Astro had brought. All right, Steve, nodded the commander. I'll have the men picked up right away and psychographed. Meantime, you go on to Venus and see Nicholas Shinny. Very well, sir, said Strong. And transmission and transmission acknowledged walters strong flipped the switch and the teleceiver screen darkened fifteen minutes later the dog star blasted off from mars heading for venus during the trip back to the young planet that was rapidly growing into a major industrial center rivaling earth strong received a report from space academy that the bartender had been picked up his name was joseph price and after questioning him under truth serum, Solar Guard security officers found the man's mind to be so filled with criminal plots and counterplots, it would take several weeks for the psychograph analyst to learn the name of the man he claimed would know the whereabouts of Wallace. This was disappointing news for Strong, especially since the report included news of a second, third and fourth strike by Wallace and Sims on spaceships near the asteroid belt. Reaching the starting place of their adventure, Venusport and the Solar Exposition, Strong and the three cadets went immediately to a small suburban section of the great city and the home of Nicholas Shinny. Shinny lived comfortably in a small house made of titan crystal, enjoying himself during the day catching Venusian fatfish and watching the stereos at night. Once an enlisted spaceman, he had been retired with full pension and was living in ease and comfort. When Strong and the three cadets arrived at the elderly spaceman's house, they found him busy teaching a young Venusian wolfhound puppy how to retrieve. "'Well, blast my jets!' cried the old man. "'If it ain't Tommy, Roger and the big fella, Astro and Captain Strong. "'Hello, Nick,' said Strong with a smile. You're a sight for space blind eyes. He 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 he, cackled Shinny, his merry eyes twinkling against his deep space tan. It's mighty good to see you, boys. Come on in the house. I got a mess of fat fish just pulled out of the stream, and some of the most delicious biscuits you ever had in your life. Well, thanks, Nick, hesitated the captain, but we're in. Can't be in too much of a hurry to eat, snapped the old man with a grin. Anything you got to say is better said when you got a belly full of Molly's cookin'. Molly, cried Tom, but Mr. Shinny. When, gulped Astro, when did you? Hey, hold on, cried the old spaceman. Just damp your tubes there, youngsters. You're way off course. Molly ain't nothing but an electronic cook I got installed in the kitchen. She cooks better than any space-brained woman, and she never opens her mouth to give me any sass. The four spacemen laughed at Shinny's obvious indignation. Now come on, he growled. Let's eat, I'm hungry. Refusing to allow them to get near Molly, Shinny began pushing food into slots, compartments, turning on switches and punching buttons. In the cozy living room, Strung relaxed while the three cadets played with the Venusian wolfhound. Finally, Shinny announced dinner, and they fell to with gusto. There wasn't much talk during the course of the meal. Strong and the boys felt that Shinny would let them know when he was ready. Finally, the meal was over. Shinny sprawled in his chair, lit his pipe, then looked at his guests, his eyes twinkling. All right, me friends, I think you've held back long enough. Let's have it. Strong immediately told the old spaceman the entire story, from Wallace and Sims' false concession at the exposition to the present. You see, Nick, he concluded, with an adjustable light key enabling them to open any lock in the solar system, nothing is safe. Personally, I think it's only because they haven't a larger or faster ship and aren't better armed that they haven't tried more daring piracy. 
They reach that point soon, though. They've already robbed four ships for arms alone. I'll do anything I can to help you, Captain, said Shinny. What is it you want to know? We suspect that Wallace has a secret hideout in the asteroid belt, said Strong. Since you once prospected the asteroids with him, I thought you might know where the hideout is. Shinji grew reflective and knocked the ashes out of his pipe before he answered. That was a long time ago, Captain. More than ten years. And Gus Wallace was a real square spaceman then. He didn't turn bad until after we split up and he met that other fella. What other fellow? asked Strong. Shinji paused. There was a hard glint in his eyes. Bull Coxine. He spat the name out as though it had left a bad taste in his mouth. Coxine, exclaimed Strong. You heard me, snorted Shinny. Bull Coxine and Gus Wallace got together after me and Wallace lost our stake hunting for uranium pitch blend in the asteroids and split up. Next thing I heard, him and Coxine was mixed up in their business up on Ganymede when the credit exchange was held up. Strong's face had turned the color of chalk. Coxine, he repeated under his breath. Noticing Strong's reaction to Shinny's statement, Tom asked, Who is Coxine, Captain Strong? Strong was silent, and Shinny turned to the cadets. When your skipper here was a young fella, just starting out in the Solar Guard, the old man explained. He was on a routine flight out to Titan, and there was a mutiny. Coxine was the ringleader. The captain joined up with Coxine after they had put his skipper in the brig. When he had Coxine's confidence, he regained control of the ship and sent Coxine and the others to a prison asteroid. Coxine has hated the captain ever since and swore to get him. But how did he pull the hold up on Ganymede then? asked Roger. Coxine escaped from the prison asteroid in a jet boat, disguised as a guard, continued Shinny. Only man ever to escape. He drifted around in the belt for a while and was picked up by a freighter going to Ganymede. The freighter had been out rocket-hopping among the asteroids, collecting the prospector's small supplies of uranium and taking the stuff back to Ganymede for refining. Wallace happened to be deadheading on the freighter. When they got to Ganymede and Coxine saw all the money lying around at the credit exchange to pay off the prospectors, he convinced Wallace to go in with him and they robbed the exchange. Coxine was caught red-handed, but Wallace got away. In fact, the solar guard didn't know Wallace had anything to do with it. So Coxine was taken back to the prison asteroid and Wallace has been drifting around the system ever since. But Mr. Shinny, asked Astro, if you knew Wallace was tied up with the robbery of the credit exchange, why didn't you tell the Solar Guard before now? Sonny, sighed Shinny, most of what I know is space dust and space gas. But even so, I don't think Commander Walters or Captain Strong or even you boys would think much of me if I went around like an old space crawler, blowing my jets all over the place. Strong had listened to Shinny fill in the background of Bull Coxine with a thoughtful look in his eyes. He remembered all too clearly the mutiny on the ship out to Titan. Coxine had been an enlisted solar guard petty officer aboard the ship. He had made great strides in two years and was being considered as an officer candidate on the very day he tried to take over the ship. When Strong regained control later, he talked to Coxine, trying to find out why he had started the mutiny. But the man had only cursed him, swearing vengeance. Strong hadn't seen him since. So you think he would know where Wallace and Sims might be hiding out? Strong asked finally. If anyone does, replied Shinny, he does. And I'll tell you this, Captain. If you go to talk to him, and I figure you will, you'll find him a lot tougher. Will I? Well, take yourself, for instance. No reflection on you, of course, but take yourself. You're smart, you're hard, and you got a good mind. You're one of the best spacemen in the deep. Take all that and turn it bad, real bad. Sour it with too many years on a prison asteroid, and you've got a fire-eating rocket buster as tough and rough as God and society can make him. The three cadets gulped and looked at Strong. 
they saw their skipper clench his teeth and ball his fists into tight knots i know said strong in a hoarse whisper but if he knows where wallace and sims are he'll tell me you can bet your last credit he'll tell me shinny paused reflectively i won't bet he said simply the air inside the space shack was stale because of a faulty filter in the oxygen circulator that neither wallace nor sims bothered to clean the two men laced around in stocking feet and undershirts listening to popular music coming over the audio receiver on a late pickup from one of the small jovian satellite colonies nearby pour me another cup of coffee sims grunted wallace the smaller man poured a cup of steaming black liquid and silently handed it over to his companion they both listened as the music faded to an end and the voice of the announcer crackled over the loudspeaker this audio cast has been beamed to space quadrants d through k as a courtesy to the army of uranium prospectors working the asteroid belt hope you've enjoyed it spacemen and happy hunting wallace reached over and snapped off the receiver thanks pal he laughed the hunting's been real good we've got a full catch the giant spaceman laughed again yeah agreed sims i just went over the take we've got enough money in that locker he indicated a black box on the floor to sit back and take it easy for the rest of our lives yeah snarled wallace you mean sitting in the sun on a crummy lakeside watching the birds and bees gus asked sim thoughtfully you got any idea how much fun we can buy with the credits in that box yeah i have sneered wallace and i know what a thousand times that much will buy too suddenly sims turned and looked his partner in the eye what do you say we quit now gus i mean it we got plenty you sound like you've been exposed to too many cosmic rays said wallace tapping his head with one finger we've got the biggest secret in the system the adjustable light key plus an airtight hideout and you want to quit it ain't that whined sims it's the other deal i don't mind going out and blasting a few freighters but to try to listen interrupted wallace i'd rather try it and take the licking if we mess it up than not try it and take that licking i know which side of the space lane i'd better be on when the time comes sims hesitated and then sighed yeah i guess you're right come on let's listen to that story spool again oh no moaned sims i know that spool by heart we've heard it at least fifty times one slip up said wallace sticking his finger in sims face just one slip up and we're finished we've got to be sure with a reluctant shrug of his shoulders sims poured another cup of coffee and sat on the side of his bunk while wallace inserted the story spool in the audio playback they settled themselves and listened as a deep voice began to speak in a loud whisper the operation will take place on the night of october twenty ninth at exactly twenty one hundred hours you will make your approach from section eleven m quadrant sims jumped up abruptly and switched off the playback turning to wallace he pleaded i can't listen to it again i know it by heart instructions on how to get to the time capsule instructions on what to take and how to build an adjustable light key after we get the plans instruction on how to hijack the first ship and what to take orders information instructions i'm sick of listening if you want to go ahead but i'm going to work on the ship okay okay said wallace getting up don't blow your jets i hate the thing as much as you do wait a minute and i'll go with you the two men began climbing into spacesuits in a few minutes they were dressed in black plastic suits with small round clear plastic helmets they stepped into the airlock on one side of the room and closed a heavy door wallace adjusted the valve in the chamber and watched the needle drop until it showed zero okay said wallace over his helmet space phones all the air is out open the outer lock sims cranked the heavy handle and the door in the opposite wall of the chamber slowly swung open they stepped out into the airless black void of space and onto the surface of an asteroid drifting in the thickest part of the belt 
surrounding the asteroid were countless smaller secondary satellites circling the mother body like a white curving blanket the mother body was perfectly hidden from outside observation it made a perfect base of operations for the two space pirates the freighter that they had used at the concession at the solar exposition and later to make their escape was a far different ship from the one now resting on the asteroid two powerful three-inch atomic blasters could be seen sticking out of the forward part of the ship and near the stern two gaping holes showed the emplacements for two additional guns not yet installed the two men walked over to the ship and while wallace entered the ship sims picked up a cutting torch and ignited it preparing to finish the two holes in the stern when wallace reappeared he was carrying a coil of wire with a double plug to attach to the space phones inside their helmets he jammed the plug into sim's helmet and then into his own sim's eyes lit up with surprise as he heard this is a general emergency announcement from solar guard headquarters squadrons a and b of the marsopolis garrison will proceed to space quadrants w sections forty one to fifty it is believed that Gus Wallace and Luther Sims are in that vicinity. Approach with caution. They are armed with atomic blasters and are believed to be psychologically unable to surrender. It is believed they will resist arrest. The voice repeated the announcement and added a general call for the men if they were listening to surrender. Wallace pulled out the two plugs and grinned at Sims. Picked it up on the teleceiver inside the ship thought you might like to know how safe we are here sims grinned back and how far off the track they are where's that space quadrant they think we're in out past saturn said wallace with a grin with the mars garrison chasing us at one end of the system we'll hit them on the other and be gone before they know what happened sims patted the barrel of the nearest atomic blaster and spacemen we're going to hit them hard End of chapter 9 Recording by Hihikiti